Welcome to Cambridge Forum, discussing reinventing discovery with author and open science advocate, Michael Nielsen. I'm Joshua Rothman of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and I'll be your moderator. Michael Nielsen is one of the pioneers of quantum computation. Together with Ike Truong of MIT, he wrote the standard text on quantum computation, which has become one of the 10 most highly cited physics books of all time. He's the author of more than 50 scientific papers, including invited contributions to Nature and Scientific American. He worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory as the Richard Chase Tolman Prize Fellow at Caltech, was Foundation Professor of Quantum Information Science and a Federation Fellow at the University of Queensland, and a senior faculty member at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. In 2008, he gave up his tenured position and traditional academic career to work full-time on open science. His new book, Reinventing Discovery, The New Era of Networked Science, which serves as the basis for our discussion, is the fruit of this work. Using the example of the Polymath Project, Nielsen introduces the concept of open science and calls for change in the way research is conducted and in the way data is handled in the era of networked science. How has network technology changed the way scientific problems are solved? How can a research system traditionally based on individual discovery adapt to support collaboration and teamwork? Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Michael Nielsen. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you to Cambridge Forum and to uh, Harvard Bookstore uh, for sponsoring tonight's event. And thank you also uh, to Josh for, uh, for acting as a moderator tonight. So my book uh, is about open science. And I'm going to basically tell you four stories uh, tonight about open science. First of all, explaining what open science is, what its promise is, what some of the challenges are and how to overcome those challenges. So let me start with a story to explain uh, what exactly open science is. So it, it's a story that starts with a mathematician named Tim Gowers. Gowers is a mathematician at Cambridge University. He's one of the world's leading mathematicians. Uh, in fact, he's a recipient of, among other honors, uh, the Fields Medal, which is sometimes compared to the Nobel Prize for mathematics. Gowers is also a blogger, and in January of 2009, he decided to do a very interesting experiment using his blog. He wrote a post with the title, Is Massively Collaborative Mathematics Possible? And what he was proposing in this post was to attack a difficult, unsolved mathematical problem, a problem which he said he'd love to solve, completely in the open, using his blog as a medium to post his ideas and his partial progress. What's more, he issued an open invitation inviting anybody in the world who thought that they had an idea to contribute to post that idea in the comments section of the blog. Pretty unusual experiment, right, for a mathematician. His hope was that by combining the ideas of many minds, it would be possible to make really easy work of this problem. He called this experiment the Polymath Project. Well, the Polymath Project actually got off to a very slow start because in the first seven hours after he posted his, uh, after he opened his blog up for discussion, not a single person posted a comment. But then a, a mathematician from the University of British Columbia named Joseph Solomosi uh, posted a suggestion. And just 15 minutes after that, a high school teacher, actually from Arizona, named Jason Dyer, chimed in with a comment of his own. And then just three minutes after that, another mathematician from UCLA, Terence Tao, uh, actually also a Fields medalist, posted a comment. And things were really, they were off and running at this point. The comments just exploded. Uh, over the next uh, 37 days, 27 different people would post 800 substantive mathematical comments containing 170 
thousand words. That's a lot of mathematics done very quickly. I was actually following along. I, I didn't participate substantively in the discussion, but I was following along right from the start. And it was just amazing to watch how quickly ideas would be proposed, often very half-baked, and they'd be really rapidly developed and improved, sometimes discarded, and sometimes being incorporated into the canon of knowledge. Uh, Gowers described the process, in fact, as being to normal research as driving is to pushing a car. At the end of the 37 days, he posted again to his blog to announce that the problem had most probably been solved. They still had to go back and check some details and make sure that they hadn't made any silly mistakes. And indeed, everything did check out, and ultimately they wrote a couple of, of papers. They cracked the problem. So the Polymath Project had been successful. Now that's a nice story, uh, particularly if you care about that particular problem. But of course, the reason why I'm interested in it and why I'm talking about it tonight, it's not really important because it solved that particular mathematical problem. The reason why it's interesting, in my opinion, is because it suggests that we can start to create tools, online tools, which in some sense are cognitive tools. And by that, I mean it can amplify, actively amplify, our collective intelligence, actually enabling us to speed up the solution of the very hardest problems, not just simple little problems, but actually problems right at the limit of human ability to solve. And this is not just going to happen in mathematics, but actually maybe broadly across many different fields. So there are many different experiments which are now going on in network science. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about them. We have about 20 minutes or so tonight. Uh, I'll just mention a couple to give you some idea of the range. There's a lovely uh, project called Galaxy Zoo now going on. Uh, it's kind of a crowdsourced approach to analysing different galaxies. They've got uh, 250,000 volunteers, have done 150 million galaxy classifications. They've shown pictures of galaxies and asked questions like, is that a spiral or an elliptical galaxy? And so they're generating all this data which can be used to answer questions about cosmology. Uh, there are other people who are doing all sorts of experiments in ideas like uh, open notebook science, where they actually share all of their research ideas in real time out on the web. But really what I want to focus on, and sort of my second story, is about some of the problems, about some of the obstacles to doing this kind of open science. It actually turns out that scientists have been tremendously inhibited in how they adopt some of these tools. So I'll tell you a story about that. Um, the story uh, begins in 2005, uh, in August, when a graduate student at Caltech named John Stockton decided, well, he, he announced a new website that he had called the Quickie. This was short for Quantum Wiki. And his idea, it was a really nice one, it was a beautiful idea. He wanted to build a site like Wikipedia, but instead of being general knowledge, it would be a research level wiki with all sorts of contributions from uh, researchers in the field. Kind of think of it as a, almost a, a super textbook, very rapidly evolving, constantly updated, with all the latest news in the field, descriptions of the big open problems, speculation about how you could solve them, maybe descriptions of what was going on in the leading edge laboratories, and so on. Okay, nice idea. Um, I happened to be at the workshop where it was announced uh, at Caltech in 2005. Different people had different opinions, but certainly I, I talked to a large number of people who were very excited about this idea. They could see all sorts of ways you could potentially use the quickie. I'd have these conversations and they'd say, oh, you could use it to do this, you could use it to do that. And we'd have a great conversation for a few minutes and then I'd say, well, so what are you planning to contribute? And they say, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. I don't have time to contribute. Right? I hope that somebody else will, but I personally don't have time. And so, unfortunately, this effort, uh, you know, when enough people believe that, it has failed. And this same story has actually been repeated, unfortunately, in many different scientific fields with many different uh, science wikis. There are Science wikis to do things like uh, the Knot uh, Atlas is, is an example. There's a string theory wiki, uh, and there are many other uh, examples. And science wikis, it's just one class 
of idea which people have explored. There are many other ideas similarly uh, which people have had. Uh, there's the idea of so-called scientific social networks. This is kind of a Facebook for scientists kind of idea. The idea being that you'll be able to connect scientists to other scientists with complementary interests so that they can share ideas, they can share questions, they can share maybe data, code, all these kinds of things, which sounds like a pretty good idea. And in fact, if you look around online, uh, there are many very well-funded scientific social networks that have been constructed by all sorts of organisations and all sorts of people. Uh, and some of these are terrifically designed sites, but if you create accounts, log in and take a look around, they're very often virtual ghost towns. There are very often very few people um, actually present. And this seems very unfortunate to me. These seem like a promising kind of an idea, certainly an idea that it's a pity the scientific community doesn't adopt more broadly, but they're not succeeding particularly well as of yet. So what's going on here? There's an important general pattern. And the pattern, I, I think it's easiest to understand if you imagine yourself as a young scientist, somebody who'd really like to make a career for yourself uh, in science. And maybe you're very excited about the potential of a site like, say, the Quickie. Maybe you think this is a great idea. Unfortunately, if you want to get a job, there's a funny career calculus facing you. Uh, you can think to yourself, should I spend, let's say, a couple of hundred hours writing a mediocre scientific paper that nobody's going to read? Well, should I spend that same time making a long slew of really brilliant contributions to the quickie? And what you know is that when you go to a hiring committee or a tenure committee or to a grant agency, you have no doubt which one they're going to value more. They're going to value that mediocre scientific paper. So it doesn't matter how much you might believe in the potential of these new sites, these new ways of constructing knowledge, it's a very hard choice to make, right, to, to work in that kind of a way. And you might say, well, so, ha so how, how does something like the Polymath Project fit into this picture? Why did it succeed? Well, actually, it fits in just perfectly, in fact. It was using an unconventional means, it's true, the blog, for, uh, but, but, but simply as a means to a very conventional end. At the end of the day, they wrote up two scientific papers um, and you know, it, it really fits into this standard career calculus. Right? So I think it's a terrific project, but it did have that kind of conservatism about it. Whereas if you think about something like the Quickie or the scientific social networks, these are sites where they're, they're purely ends in themselves. Right? You're not doing something which is rewarded within the standard scientific culture when you contribute to one of these sites. You're doing something that's entirely outside that standard reward system, the standard incentive system, and it's very hard. There's a big opportunity cost associated to participating. Right? So, so what I'm talking about, or the problem I'm talking about then, is one of changing the culture of science, changing the incentives facing particularly young scientists, so that, that it will reward this kind of behaviour in proportion to its scientific merit. Right? And that sounds like a very hard thing to do. It is a very hard thing uh, to do. But I want to give you two examples from the past where it has actually successfully been done. And the first one relates to the Human Genome Project. So you go back to the early 1990s and the world's leading molecular biologists can all see that it's just a matter of time before the genome is sequenced. But there's an important question, which is what's going to happen to that genetic data? It's actually very similar at that time to something like the Quickie. If you're a young scientist who's taking genetic data, you're not going to get, there's no incentive to reveal this freely to everybody else. You're not publishing a paper. You're simply helping your competitors if you upload it to one of the online databases, something like GenBank. This is not necessarily in your best interest. But fortunately, everybody in that community could see this kind of problem. There was a lot of discussion about what should happen. Um, I'm kind of oversimplifying the story a bit, but certainly a crucial event occurred in 1996 when a lot of the leaders from the Human Genome Project got together for
for a meeting in Bermuda. They also got together with, uh, so Craig Venter was there. He was the person who led the private effort to sequence the genome. Uh, people from the Wellcome Trust and the United States uh, National Institutes of Health were all present. Um, so people from the leading funding agencies. And they sat and they talked over uh, this problem for quite some time. And basically there was a, a real feeling there that although people didn't unilaterally want to go ahead and share the data online, actually everybody could see it was in the community's collective best interest to do so and they were willing to sign on to do it provided everybody else would do it. So they drafted what are now called the Bermuda Principles which state essentially two things. One is that if you took a thousand base pairs of genetic data in the laboratory then it should be within 24 hours uploaded online to a site like GenBank or some other big genetic online, uh, online genetic database. Second, that that data would be put into the public domain. Right? And this wasn't just toothless words from this meeting, but actually the representatives from the grant agencies went back to those grant agencies and within 12 months, these Bermuda principles were actually baked into policy at the grant agencies. And that meant that if you wanted to get money to work on the genome, you needed to agree to abide by those principles. And this has had a wonderful consequence, which is you can take your smartphone out now and you can download uh, that data very quickly. So that's a nice story, but unfortunately, the human genome is just such a tiny, tiny fraction of all human scientific knowledge. Even if you just look at genomes for other species, the situation is very patchy, to say the least. One uh, biologist of my acquaintance made the comment to me after a talk that he'd been, and I quote, sitting on the genome for an entire species for more than a year. Right? That's a genome for a whole species of life, and it had been sitting there, essentially undergoing bit rot, I guess, on his hard disk. Um, yeah, this is not good. And yet that's generically the situation. Most scientific data taken in scientific laboratories sits inside. It is not systematically shared with other, with other scientists who could be making other discoveries based on that data. And the same thing is true of a tremendous amount of scientific uh, knowledge. It's not just data, but also scientific code, which often expresses important scientific ideas. And then all the half-baked questions, ideas, and speculations which individual scientists have. So I'd like to see that unlocked. Let me tell you a second story, a much bigger one, one that affects everybody in this room dramatically about how a cultural change has been achieved in the past. But I need to go all the way back to the dawn of modern science, back to the early 1600s. So it's uh, 1609 and Galileo has constructed for the first time an astronomical telescope. It's December 1609. And for whatever reason, I, I believe the reason is lost to history, he waits seven months before he points it at Saturn. But when he does point it at Saturn, he discovers something very interesting. First, first time he does it, uh, July 25th, uh, 1610. He's expecting to see a little disk. And indeed, he does see a little disk, but actually what he's not expecting to see is two bumps on either side of that disk. Right. What he was seeing was the first hint of the rings of Saturn. Okay. And does he announce this discovery to the world? No. What he does is he writes down a description of the discovery in his notes. He realises, I should say, that this is a major discovery. It's hard for us to think of now, but at the time, you know, our view of the heavens really had, had almost not changed in thousands of years. So this was a huge thing to have learned. Okay. He writes it down in his notes, and then he scrambles the letters into an anagram, and he mails it off immediately that day to four of his astronomer colleagues, including the great astronomer Kepler. And the reason he does this is so that if, say, Kepler later makes the same discovery, then he can reveal the anagram and still get the credit, but in the meantime, he hasn't revealed anything at all. Okay? It's tempting to say, oh, he's a bad guy. But unfortunately, this was really common at the time. Right? It's not just Galileo. Leonardo did this. Huygens did this. Uh, 
uh, Newton did this. Uh, Robert Hooke of Hooke's Law, that's how he uh, revealed Hooke's Law, if you've heard of Hooke's Law. It was quite a common practice at the time. There was no incentive for scientists to reveal these kinds of discoveries. And so today we think, oh, well, we solved that problem back then. Uh, invention of the scientific journal, 1665, scientists started publishing news of their discoveries. And as a one sentence summary, that's kind of true, and, and it's a huge, obviously a huge benefit uh, to humanity. But actually the situation is really a lot more complicated uh, than that. Uh, let me tell you a little story involving uh, Henry Oldenburg. He was the editor of the first scientific journal and about the trouble he had convincing scientists to reveal their knowledge, to publish scientific papers. So this is adapted from Mary Bowers Hall, who was his uh, biographer. Uh, and it, Oldenburg would, quote, beg for information, sometimes writing simultaneously to two competing scientists on the grounds that it would be best to tell A what B was doing and vice versa in the hope of stimulating both men, it was men at the time, to more work and more openness. So he'd kind of engage in these funny correspondences, bouncing letters backwards and forwards, and trying to cajole uh, you know, each person into revealing more and more by saying, oh, the other person is ahead of you, right? Kind of a ridiculous situation. Another uh, nice quote from Elizabeth Eisenstein, one of the great scholars of the printing press, she's talking, she's puzzled She's talking about the 17th century and why scientists hadn't adopted the printing press. She writes, exploitation of the mass medium, books, was more common among pseudoscientists and quacks than among Latin writing professional scientists who often withheld their work from the press. Well, this is 220 years after Gutenberg. It is not next week or you know, even next decade or even next century. And scientists are still very secretive. So what actually caused then the transition to this modern system we have, where at least scientists publish, well, what caused the, tr the transition was establishing a link between publication of papers and career success, what, what modern scientists take for granted. But this transition actually took decades. Some historians have called it an open science revolution. And it's really, obviously, absolutely critical to our modern world. It's, it's, one of the most important events in history, I, I would argue. And uh, to sort of oversimplify, there's a, a historian at Stanford named Paul David who studied how this transition occurred. And to sum up his story, it's really a very complicated one, in, but in two words, it comes down to patron pressure. So what do I mean by that? It's, it's, uh, I can explain that with the story of Galileo and one of his earlier discoveries which was of the four moons of Jupiter. So this was maybe Galileo's first really big discovery uh, before the, uh, the uh, uh, rings of Saturn. He found that uh, Galileo, excuse me, that Jupiter had these four uh, satellites. So he made this discovery in, I believe, January of 1610. And he did immediately announce this to the world. And he did so for a very interesting reason. He was not happy with his living circumstances at the time. So when he made the discovery, he immediately wrote to potential patrons, including the Medici family, and said, I will name these moons after you if you agree to become my patrons. And the Medici said, sure. And if you actually look at the pamphlet that Galileo published announcing them, uh, almost the largest letters uh, announcing Medicia Sidera, uh, which I guess means Medician moons, it actually outranks Galileo's name on the pamphlet. Um, you know, basically, funders, or patrons in that case, often have much more incentive for openness than scientists do. They have different incentives. And David argues that this is what caused this open science revolution. Now let's come back to modern times. I talked about the genome before. There's a real parallel in this story. The genome today is open in part because of funder pressure. It's a very similar kind of a situation, very similar story. What I would say today is that really grant agencies should be working more broadly towards stronger open data policies for a broader range of data much earlier in the discovery process. And they should also be working towards other kinds of openness police policies, open code policies, because often computer code expresses important scientific knowledge. And they can also do things like legitimizing new tools by encouraging scientists 
when they submit grant applications to submit non-standard evidence of impact and you know, you, to do things like using contributions to sites like the Quickie as evidence of their scientific impact. I certainly believe personally that publicly funded science really should be open science. There's some caveats to that. There are obvious exceptions for things like confidential and proprietary knowledge. But as a broad general principle, I believe publicly funded science should be open science and we can do a tremendous amount to move in that direction. The reason I wrote the book is because I wanted to make open science into a public issue. I think internal to the scientific community there needs to be a serious conversation about what types of contribution it values. And then in general in the public I think there needs to be a public discussion of what type of scientific culture we want us to support by public money. So thank you all very much for your attention. <clears throat> You're joining us at Cambridge Forum listening to Michael Nielsen discussing his new book, Reinventing Discovery. Uh, thanks very much, Michael, for that fascinating talk. I, I want to start by asking a question about your story, which is, um, you know, quantum computing uh, has got to be one of the most exciting, fascinating, um, important developments in modern science today. So what was it that made you step away from that research effort and toward this uh, topic of open science? Why, why did open science uh, seem so important to you that it was worth doing that? Uh, so there's a couple of things. Um, one, when I started working on quantum computing in, I guess, the early 90s, very few people in the world were doing it. Now there's several thousand people, and it just doesn't feel like, personally, my presence doesn't really matter so much, um, you know, one way or the other, when there's a lot of extremely capable people. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I've been interested in ideas associated to open science, actually, for more than, for more than 20 years, um, going back even slightly before there was a web, and I took it for granted in the 90s that we'd see all sorts of amazing things uh, happen. And I'd start to see that in general culture, the rise of Facebook, the rise of Google, the rise of Wikipedia. These are all amazing things. And then within the scientific community, things seemed very, very slow. And this got very frustrating. And so I guess I took a break from uh, my job for a couple of months in 2007. And I thought, what's the most important thing I could be doing? And I decided that this was it. So, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, one other question I had for you. Um, it seems like in talking about uh, open science, there's two, well, there's two sorts of efforts that you've mentioned. One is a sort of uh, information repository. Um, and another is a kind of collective thinking. And I think in your book, that's what you call it, collective thinking. Um, and yet, it seems to me, uh, collective thinking is a slightly unnerving concept, and even the phrase is very close to something like groupthink. Um, and it seems to me, for example, if I were to, if I had a blog that was devoted to healthcare policy, and I said, I'm going to open the comments uh, to a discussion about how best to fix the healthcare system, it would not be the case that after a few days I would have solved the problem uh, in some way. <laughs> so what is it about scientific problems, or what sorts of scientific problems are the ones that are most uh, amenable to this sort of open science? And are there problems that are not amenable to this kind of open science approach? So it's a great question. Um, certainly at least part of what's going on. I'll use the Polymath Project as an example because I've talked about it a bit. If you look in the discussion area, it's amazingly civil, right? And you have to ask yourself, why is it so civil? Why are they all agreeing so easily with one another? When if you look you know, on a you know, discussion on many other blogs, uh, it's all people shouting at one another. And of course, it's because there are very strongly held standards in much of science for what it means to have a valid ins insight into a problem. That's not to say that people don't occasionally make mistakes. The polymaths would occasionally, they'd say something wrong, but immediately somebody would come back and say, oh, you've made a mistake there. There are some funny mistakes. There are people actually counting things uh, sort of wrongly, that kind of uh, uh, problem. But it's easy to point those out and for everybody to agree. And so there are some problems where you have, I guess, what I call a shared praxis where there's a, a lot of community agreement on what it means to make progress. And when you have that, you, this kind of collaboration can scale. But when you have fundamental disagreements about values, as in the case of, say, healthcare, 
it's, you know, the, the discussion tends to fragment around that and you never get past that basic discussion of values. But fortunately, that's not the case in certainly a large part of science and it's also, you know, there are a couple of other parts of human knowledge where that's true. Programming is a good example. I think that's part of the reason why open source is successful. Or mathematics, which is the yeah. sort of initial example. Indeed. That's great. Well, you're listening to Cambridge Forum with author uh, and quantum computing pioneer Michael Nielsen as we continue our discussion of reinventing discovery, exploring the future of scientific research and the coming era of networked science. At this point in the program, we'll take questions from the audience. So please line up if you have a question at the microphone uh, and, uh, and try to be succinct. Are, are there questions? Take your time. Yes, please. You, you, have, to, you have to walk up to the microphone up here. I was kind of curious on a topic. You mentioned Galileo and the discovery of the uh, Jupiter moons. Uh, today, NASA actually publishes the data from their planetary probes, and it's open on this Goddard Space Flight Center site called Planetary Database. Yeah. And the Europeans, the European Space Agency does the same. And you actually have cases of discovery of planetary objects by like high school students in China who just have access to the internet. Yeah. It's not collaborative, but I was wondering if you could sort of expound on that. It's almost, you know, the bookends of the Galileo story. I was wondering if that's in your book and yeah. thoughts about that as a um, role. That so I have to say, overall, I think probably the astronomy community has been the community that's moved the furthest in this direction. There's huge amounts of open data um, from the astronomy uh, community which can be used to do all sorts of interesting uh, uh, stuff. I guess another example, just to riff on your theme, uh, uh, is uh, a huge amount of, a huge fraction of the comets which have ever been discovered have been discovered by people looking at data which has been released by organisations like NASA. Um, there's a uh, German named uh, Rainer Krupp who uh, has discovered about 250 comets, I think. He just does this in his spare time. He looks at photos from one of the uh, NASA missions to the sun, and uh, every once in a while he says, oh, there's another comet. And so he's up to uh, 250 or so at this point. Uh, it, it's, it's a really nice thing to see. I don't know if I'm addressing your, your question completely or not, but uh, yeah. You mentioned the fact that the incentives for scientists to participate in open science or networked science are, are not there, and you suggested that one of the ways to encourage this kind of discovery would be for funders to discourage it, the, to encourage it, the patron pressure. Um, how would you go about persuading funders to require open science and open access. I mean, you talked about values in the social sciences, public policy, but it seems there is, a, in this country at least, a very big value divide between proprietary ownership and open access. Sure. So, uh, you know, it, it's certainly something that's under discussion at the... Uh, at the grant agencies, and you know, part of part of my reason for writing the the book is to to have more public discussion, which people are certainly aware of um, uh, inside those uh, inside those agencies. Um, it's also true that they have slightly different incentives from individual and sci scientists, as I said. So it makes it maybe a little easier for them to uh, 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 for them to act. Um, you know, so that discussion is ongoing. It's also something which individuals can uh, can potentially contribute to. Uh, there's, for example, an organisation known as the Alliance for Taxpayer Access, uh, which has done a great deal um, for enabling open access to the scientific literature. And uh, through lobbying uh, and through contacts with the grant agencies, and that's something which uh, you know, members of the public uh, can get involved uh, with. They can make donations to and help support uh, that kind of an effort. They also they have a list of action items uh, on their website, you know, things which people can do uh, to help some of the legislation uh, come through that needs to come through. Yeah. So I've got a couple of questions. Joshua asked my first and second question, so I've got a couple of more. Um, one is, can you 
give us any more success stories for this collaborative, collective, online, open source type of, of paradigm. And the second question is, I, I could understand what you were doing when you were working on quantum computing and doing research and writing papers and writing textbooks, but you left that, so what are you doing now? I don't understand what you're doing. Are you part of an advocacy group? or So those are my two questions. Okay, so um, let me see. Uh, danger. Well, okay, so to address your first question, I mean, just to give another example, um, I'll expand maybe on an example I mentioned just very, very briefly. It also addresses, to some extent, your question. Um, so the, the um, uh, which is the Galaxy Zoo project. So I mentioned that they had, they had actually a million galaxy images which they wanted analysed in a variety of different ways. Um, so they recruited ultimately a quarter of a million people to actually do 150 million different classifications. Um, and one of the interesting things which they discovered was that they weren't just getting classification information, but actually these amateurs were starting to, they were identifying new types of object. They'd say, oh, this looks strange. Um, one of the most interesting things that they identified was pretty early on, some people started to notice some galaxies that didn't look like any of the existing galaxy classes. And uh, somebody started a, uh, a thread on the discussion forum entitled, Give Peas a Chance. And they call them the green pea galaxies, because that's what they look like. They look like little green peas. Anyway, uh, very interesting. It's actually almost a polymath style collaboration uh, started to take place. So at first, the discussion, you know, it's amateurs talking about it and they're just having fun, you know, they're making jokes, peas stop and all these kinds of things. But gradually it gets more and more sophisticated. They start to do some simple spectral analysis. Uh, I'm a physicist, I can understand this. But gradually, their sophistication at spectral analysis goes way beyond mine and they've got all these sophisticated criteria for what these galaxies are, and they're doing database queries to automatically extract them uh, from this database of, of images. And ultimately, uh, sort of the collection they came up with actually fed into an analysis done by professional astronomers, and there is indeed these new class of P galaxies, uh, which is known. So it's a pretty nice uh, example of, of an online collaboration actually enabling amateurs to do uh, some very sophisticated science. In regards to what exactly I'm doing, well, the first thing I, I thought I would do uh, sort of to support open science was write this book, which I assumed would take about six months or so. Um, I was uh, quite badly wrong, actually. It took me, uh, it took me several years. Um, so that's now done. As regards what comes next, um, th that's still... I'm still deciding uh, what exactly to do. It will be an open science project, but actually more geared towards uh, the... I'm, I'm going to, to start a not-for-profit organisation which is actually geared towards creating uh, tools around open knowledge and open science. Yeah. But that's, uh, that's still getting off the ground at the moment. Yeah, hi. Um, so I had a question. I'm a bit worried. So you're actually selling a book, right? And this book will be only available actually to people that are like, that actually want to buy this book or are interested in the topic. That sounds a bit contradictory, right? So you talk about open science and open source, open data, all this kind of stuff, but then you publish something which is only available to people that actually buy that. Wouldn't you be better off with like starting some kind of project maybe in the internet, backed up by your name or something, or by like some fellow, backed up, that, that, just starting some project in the internet, backed up by your name or by some fellow researchers that kind of whatever like brings this idea to, to the mind of people? I just feel like taking like the old medium book, you know, it might be not just the right way, uh, just the right way actually sure, for this approach. Sure. So something, uh, well, I've done a huge amount of that. Um, so for example, I did most of the research for the book in the open and published a large number of essays in various free formats. Um, a lot of the background, I've written, I guess, a couple hundred thousand words um, of background stuff that's related. Um, and there's a, you know, a sizable online open science community um, which I participate in. Um, a discussion which I had with my publisher very early on was about making the book available under a Creative Commons license. Um, I was extremely keen. Uh, they were not very keen at all for pragmatic business reasons. Now, as a point of principle, that doesn't bother me in the sense that I'm arguing that publicly funded science should be open science. 
this is neither publicly funded nor, strictly speaking, is it science. I certainly am not trying to advocate that all cultural artefacts, all digital artefacts, should be free. I'm not trying to argue that every piece of music in the world should be free, every movie should be free, or anything like that. If private individuals want to make those things and keep them proprietary, uh, I have no particular problem with that. As a point of practice, oh, I much prefer the book uh, to be licensed under a Creative Commons uh, uh, license. Um, certainly I plan to revisit that with my, uh, with my publisher once they're a bit happier about the pragmatic uh, business side uh, of it. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I came in a couple of minutes late, but <clears throat> um, I, perhaps you've already done this, uh, approach Google or Apple or Microsoft or others to uh, fund an open science network uh, activity and to help uh, spread the word at uh, academic uh, conferences on different scientific topics, et cetera, to help you know, multiply the exposure of your ideas. So uh, there's a certain amount of work being done within large companies, um, like you mentioned. Uh, interestingly enough, Microsoft actually has been particularly, uh, they've been very involved for a number of years. One of the great pioneers of open science is Jim Gray, who's a Microsoft researcher who's actually responsible for the data behind Galaxy Zoo, for example. Uh, it's really his work back in actually the late 90s and early 2000s that, uh, that helped that happen. Um, you know, those companies, there's a, patchy, there's a patchy response. To some extent, they don't necessarily see it as being a core interest. So a service like Google, for example, I'm not sure that they necessarily see how to make money uh, in this kind of space, which is a little bit unfortunate. There is, however, a flourishing ecosystem of startups uh, who are trying to make some kind of progress uh, in this space, and, and that's encouraging uh, to see. Um, yeah, it, I, I don't quite know where they'll get to, but uh, but, but it's encouraging. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that there needs to be a shift within the culture, and it sounds like it's very frustrating when you see these things happening generally, but especially um, with respect to Wikipedia and Facebook. Um, and you touched a little bit on re-incentivizing the whole structure. But what I'm curious to see is, do you see shifts within the culture that are s sort of taking place naturally as a result of the backgrounds that these scientists are coming from? For example, like it, within the younger crop of scientists, or I would love to hear about that. Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I, I guess when I give talks about this, um, the most conservative response doesn't come from older scientists. It actually comes from people who are at the middle of their careers. So these are people who are just about to come up for tenure or something like that. And they have very little control over their future. Um, and, and so they, tend, you know, they see themselves as being stuck inside a system which they cannot change. Right? They have no control, and so they, they kind of tend to regard the system as being fixed, immutable, like it's going to you know, stay that way for all time. Um, certainly when you talk to younger scientists, when I talk to members of the general public, and when I talk to very senior scientists, they often see it as being a little bit more uh, mutable. At the end of the day, it's all, you know, there's a social agreement which we've forged about how uh, science should be done, and we can change that social agreement if there's enough will and imagination applied. Um, so I think, you know, to come to your, your question about younger scientists, um, you know, it's interesting, certainly some of those people, you know, they don't know what you shouldn't do. Uh, and so some of the most interesting projects have actually been done, in some cases, by undergraduates or high school students who are just willing to jump in and say, yeah, here's how you do it. It's, uh, it's great to see. Thanks for your talk. Uh, <clears throat> putting uh, astronomy aside for a moment, yeah. I wondered if you'd talk about um, any, uh, any of the pressing scientific challenges uh, facing us currently, whether it be uh, climate science or the, uh, the menace of HIV AIDS and the efforts to find cures to that. How might open science spur progress in those areas or those fields in specifically uh, these tools that you talk about are, I mean, I, I suppose I imagine a spectrum of uh, possibilities ranging from apps to, I guess you refer to cultural shifts. So what, what kind of tools do you envision? 
Okay, so that's a kind of a complicated multi-part question. Um, let me see if I can hone in, hone in on a couple of, couple of aspects. Um, so you talk about, for example, a uh, medical issue like HIV AIDS versus a, a climate science. So climate, it comes back to a little bit what Josh uh, was talking about. Um, to some extent, there's actually a problem with applying some of these techniques, which is caused by the fact that it's such a political hot button issue, which may, does, does mean that there are some interesting challenges associated with making discussion open, with making data open, and so on. And so in that particular case, that, that's actually a situation where I'd qualify my remarks a little bit and say, it's best to do things slowly and see what the impact is as you gradually open up the process. Um, because there are external interests who are, you know, really do have uh, sort of their own agenda uh, and it's not clear necessarily how that's going to distort uh, the process. And that's true in the case of, uh, of climate. It's a bit of a, in some ways it's a bit of a special case. Uh, in the case of something like medical uh, research, certainly, you know, it's, I actually don't know what the situation is for HIV AIDS, but I know that for a lot of uh, disease conditions, Actually, there's a shocking amount of data uh, which is still kept internal to laboratories. Uh, took to certainly some cancer researchers, for example, and they will just bemoan the fact that uh, it's uh, research is carried on in such a secretive uh, fashion when they could be getting benefit uh, by sharing data much more broadly. Um, and they just say, well, you know, that's the way the system is. Or well, they, they tend to shrug their shoulders and, uh, you know, it's a very unfortunate kind of a, a situation. But certainly being able to see each other's data of something where which could really have a big impact there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So that was the other part of your of your question. Can you remind me? Uh, actually, maybe you should come. Okay. So huh, that's a very very broad um, uh, uh, question. Um, again, I'll try and home in on just one particular uh, example. If you look at I talked a lot about the Polymath project. Um, this was all done free, with free off-the-shelf tools that were not actually designed for the process at all. Right? It was done using standard blogging software and standard wiki software. Actually, I didn't mention the wiki, but, but uh, that was also in there. And you know, it's broken in all kinds of ways. It's really not well adapted to the process. It was almost impossible to track the conversation. It was difficult to see who was saying what, when, uh, who was replying to who, all these kinds of things. It's kind of amazing that the process worked as well as it did. So you can certainly come back there and just spend a lot of time redesigning and improving that software and you get a real advantage uh, in terms of the whole process. So that's just one of many uh, answers I guess you could give. I have a question about uh, motivation, I guess would be a good way to put it. Um, so in the example, the, the mathematics example that you started with, when I envision, uh, I'm not a mathematician, but when I envision why I would like to be a mathematician, one of the reasons is because I think it would be great to solve an amazing math, mathematical puzzle myself. Um, and like, you know, when Wordsworth, for example, described Newton, he described him as, um, you know, a, a, a soul forever voyaging through strange seas of thought alone. Um, and I wonder how much this Im image of a scientist as someone sort of commenting on a blog, um, participating in a group uh, conversation online or contributing to Wikipedia or something like that runs against a certain idea of what a scientist is and of what the kind of glory or pleasure of science is. So of course, Newton also said at the end of his life to Hooke that if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants, right? So, despite Wordsworth's romanticism, uh, Newton saw himself in a very different kind of a way. Um, uh, you know, I think it's true to say that to some extent science has always been collaborative, um, but usually very small scale collaborations using, you, know, you, tr you, you build up a relationship of trust with particular uh, uh, people. Actually, famously, Newton had a falling out with Hooke and, and it was very hard for them uh, to converse in, in later years. Um, if you look at the way science is currently done, in some funny way, it's actually one big collaboration at the moment 
which is I can go back and I can benefit from Albert Einstein's thinking by reading his papers, or I can go back and benefit from you know, Newton's thinking, in, in fact. So, it, so in that sense, it really is a collaborative endeavor. And I'm just talking about speeding up and accelerating that whole process. Can you, can you envision a time when these sorts of collaborative tools are woven uh, quite deeply into the day-to-day, -day, kind of day-to-day -day work of being a scientist? Like, what would a day in the life of a scientist in, in 20 years look like if, if um, this open science revolution really took so, root? So, so there are certainly two things that I would like to see change in, in a big way. One is, when I, as a scientist, when I'm working on quantum computing, right, most of my time, so I pick some big problem that I think I've got a lot of expertise in and I'm just the right person to solve. And you kind of work on it for a while. And what starts to happen is sub-problems start to arise. And you look at that little sub-problem and you say, oh, you know, you know, I totally don't know what's going on there. Somebody else, you know, it'll take me a month to solve that little sub-problem. But somebody else somewhere in the world could solve that problem sometimes in 10 minutes or 15 minutes because they have just the right expertise. Certainly I'd like to, to be able to, to outsource all of that. You should have the right person working on the right problem at the right time. Uh, uh, Could you give an example of what one of those side problems uh, might be like? Okay, well, okay, I'll give you a famous kind of old example, which is, uh, uh, I'm kind of cherry picking a bit, but that's okay, um, which is Galileo. Oh, Galileo. I've got Galileo on the brain. Einstein, one of his modern successors, you know, he was working on this theory of gravity uh, at the start of the 20th century. And he was trying to combine gravity with relativity. And uh, he was absolutely shocked after, I guess, about four years of working on it to realise this was something he totally didn't anticipate, and it sounds very strange, that it was actually connected to the geometry of the world. And that, in fact, you know, geometry is actually... The shape of space and time is different than what we naively think. You need a completely different description. Now, this sounds crazy and, and weird, but it was crazy for Einstein as well. He was not expecting this. And he, was, he got stuck because he didn't have the right kind of expertise. And it was just luck. It was fortuitous serendipity that he had a friend, Marcel Grossman, who was an expert on these kind of non-standard geometries. He'd gone to Grossman and said, he, what did he say? He said something like, uh, Grossman, you must help me. I am going crazy. That's actually a translation from the German. And, uh, and Grossman said, oh, that's easy. You just need to go and look at these papers. And Einstein got unstuck uh, essentially immediately. And so that kind of serendipitous interaction is kind of nice. In the past, it had to happen through luck. In the future, I hope it will actually happen uh, as, a, as, a matter of, as a matter of course. It should be routine. So a kind of inter-specialization would be a really big part of yeah. it. That's, that's really fascinating. So, who gets the Nobel Prize for solving the polymath math question? Okay, so this is a really interesting question. If you look at the, uh, the last physics Nobel Prize, which was given to Sol Perlmutter, Brian Schmidt, and uh, Adam Rees, um, this was actually a large team project. In fact, it was two interlinked teams, and Brian Schmidt in particular. So this was a prize for stuff associated with kind of the, the accelerating universe and, and what, what is, you know, what's the structure of the universe, these kinds of questions. And Schmidt has repeatedly tried to convince people giving the prize, not to give it to him, all the prizes he's won in the past, but has actually repeatedly made the case that it should be given to the whole collaboration. Um, with mixed success, he's actually managed to convince a couple of the, uh, the prize givers to do it, but I don't, think the, uh, I don't think the Nobel Committee did that. They decided to award it to the individuals. So I think it's quite clear that it should go, uh, it should go to the whole group. Um, there is some notion of you know, different level of contribution still, but you know, if it's done by a large collaboration, give them all credit. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Uh, okay, well, there's, there's an interesting pecuniary problem to be solved there. I haven't thought about that, to be honest. It's a good one. It's a good one. I'd like to hear your uh, advice for young scientists and your advice for older scientists. Okay. 
Well, for younger scientists, um, certainly one very simple thing that can be done is to spend a little bit of time working in the open. Don't spend all of your time uh, doing it. It's not in your career best interest. But you can spend five or ten hours a week and do something really quite significant, and that starts to change the culture. It's a small contribution, but something that's still very vital. Start a blog, contribute to a wiki, share some of your data, share some code. For older scientists, it really depends on what they're... Uh, sort of on who they are and what situation they're in. Very frequently, they're in the situation of assessing uh, young scientists and deciding what, how their career should progress. And uh, you know, they're in a position to just add you know, one sentence to a uh, position description saying, uh, please submit you know, evidence of non-traditional mm -hmm. impact, something like that. I mean, it sounds silly, but it has actually a big impact. You also occasionally hear some, I've heard funny conversations. Uh, I'll hear, uh, you know, such and such a famous scientist wrote a comment on so-and-so's blog. And this would be said in awed tones by younger scientists. It has a real legitimizing uh, uh, effect, saying you're not wasting your time doing these uh, kinds of activities. You're actually uh, doing something serious. OK, wonderful. Thank you. Michael Nielsen. Good job. You've been listening to a program of Cambridge Forum, recorded in November 2011, co-sponsored by the First Parish in Cambridge, Unitarian Universalist, the Lowell Institute, and the Friends of Cambridge Forum. For a CD of this forum entitled Reinventing Discovery, or for additional information about our ongoing radio series and our forum network webcasts, visit us on the web at cambridgeforum.org. In Harvard Square, I'm Joshua Rothman. Thanks for joining us.